when we were talking about um, anti-inflammatory diets, you mentioned green tea. And I know you are a particular fan of green tea in, in particular, from what I understand, it's matcha. Can you tell me about, you know, when you became aware of matcha, what happened there and why you're so passionate about people drinking more of it? Uh, when I was growing up, tea was something drunk by old people and sick people. And I drank iced tea, heavily sweetened. Um, when I was 17, I had a chance to live in Japan with Japanese family. And I really came to love green tea. Uh, it was very good. And I'd seen nothing like that in, in America. And I was also introduced at that time to matcha in the Japanese tea ceremony. Matcha is the powdered green tea that's whisked into a, a froth and consumed in the tea ceremony. And I began bringing that back when I would go to Japan and turn people onto it. Nobody had ever heard of it. Uh, in, in the States. And then sometime in the 1980s, I think this was again way ahead of its time, I formed a connection with a uh, Japanese company that produced matcha and tried to sell it through my website, drweil.com, but it was not the right time for it. And then uh, it's been quite amazing to me to watch uh, how fashionable matcha has become in recent years. But uh, I was concerned that most of the stuff that people were drinking was not good quality because uh, matcha is so finely powdered that it oxidizes very quickly and it loses its bright green color and, and uh, good flavor. And so I wanted to make really good quality matcha available. And I again formed a relationship with another Japanese company near Kyoto and uh, formed a company called matcha.com, matchakari, that's selling this. And... Um, you know, turning a lot of people on to, to, to this. I think it's a wonderful product. First of all, there's a great deal of research on the health benefits of tea in general, on green tea in particular, uh, a lot due to its antioxidant uh, content. Uh, matcha is different in that the leaves are grown in a way that increases the content of antioxidants. And, and it also has a high content of an amino acid called L-theanine that has a calming effect. And I think that modifies the effect of caffeine uh, and makes the stimulation of, of tea and matcha in particular uh, very different from that of coffee. It does not have the jangling effect of, of coffee. It does not leave you with a crash when the stimulation wears off, people say it causes a state of calm alertness um, that I think is very desirable. So I think it's a good thing. Much is also beautiful and, uh, and delicious, and I'm going to have a bowl of it after we finish talking. There's a ritual, isn't there, in Japan as to how this is prepared, though? And I, I, I sort of feel like this, the, the matcha tea that you sell when, what are people buying? They're buying the powder that they then have to... They buy the powder, and I don't care what they do with it. I mean, if they want to use an electric whisk, if they want to make a latte out of it, if they want to sweeten it, you know, however they want to do it. I, I like doing it in the traditional way, which is using a bamboo whisk in a small amount of hot water unsweetened. Uh, but, you know, in, in Japan now, matcha has escaped the tea ceremony ritual. Uh, that's really a kind of old-fashioned thing, and, and matcha is now consumed mostly by people, uh, not as part of a ritual. Although I think um, there's a long association of tea in general, and matcha in particular, with meditation. And uh, again, very different association from uh, from that of coffee. Um, I think matcha has been associated with contemplation, with meditation, uh, and the ritual of preparing it. You know, when I whisk it in a bowl, I find that to be very meditative and relaxing. I think what what you're speaking to there is something that, again, I think is a missing piece in modern life and and, and even in modern day health promotion, which is it's not only what you're doing it's how you're doing it. So, you know, if you're taking five or 10 minutes to prepare your green tea, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's not just a habit, it's, it's a ritual. It's a time to dedicate to yourself to actually be present with a certain process. And, 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 you know, I mean, interested is your view on this, but I've been thinking recently that we do science we, we look at green tea or we look at the polyphenols in coffee and we go, oh, this is a great thing. And so we, in our rush lives, we, you know, we make a quick coffee, we slug it down and we go and then we 
say, oh yeah, it's got loads of polyphenols and it's really good for me. And I kind of feel, have we lost something somewhere? Because for me, for example, I do drink coffee. I've, I've limited it. To, I know what works for me, but I have it first thing in the morning. Now I know people will say, because I'm an early riser, I'm usually up by five. People will say it's, you know, it's probably not with your circadian biology, the perfect time to have it. However, mm -hmm. I would argue that, you know what, that hour, hour and a half in the morning before my wife and kids get up is my sacred time for myself. Yeah. And I, I make it in a very ritualistic way. I, I don't slug it down while doing something else. I'm paying attention to it. And I, I feel actually for me on balance, when you take into account everything, yeah. that forms a very important part of my day. And you know, I, I feel more and more we're missing this piece when we yeah, I, I hear you, I agree with you, and I, I would extend that to eating in general. And one of the things that um, struck me when I, especially when I spent time in Italy and in France, is how different the attitude is of people toward eating. Um, you know, that, that in the U.S., you are rushed out of restaurants. Uh, it's in a hurry. Uh, there's a lot of concern about, you know, is this healthy? Is this not healthy? I think in, um, in continental Europe, especially in France and Italy, uh, there's so much more attention and time given to the enjoyment of food, uh, to lingering over it, to sharing uh, eating in company as a social ritual. And I think that has you know, as much to do with the uh, lowered rates of obesity, for example, as, you know, the, what, what people are eating. Yeah. I mean, I think there was a study, a UK study, I think it was the University of Birmingham, um, a few years ago showed that actually, if you eat in a rush while distracted, so doing mm -hmm. something else, watching television, you eat more at that meal and at subsequent meals for the rest of the day. Right, which, uh -huh. which again, really speaks to what you're saying. You know, there, there are, it's not just what you're eating, it's how you're eating, it's the yeah. intention, it's what's going on in the mind as you're eating. Yeah, um, yeah super interesting. So I, I, I feel you've, uh, you, you've definitely uh, sparked my interest to have some uh, matcha tea this weekend. What's the, what's the, what's the URL? I think it's, what, what, what it's, it's just matcha.com, matcha.com. Fantastic, yeah. Um, what about your daily routine? I mean, you're someone who yeah. has been sort of, you know, really a pioneer in this field. And I think a lot of us would be interested to know how do you, I mean, you know, how old are you now? I think it's, is it? I am 79. I mean, 79, incredible and looking in tip top health. Um, what do you do on a daily basis? Cause I think it would be quite, if you're, if you're happy. I get up early. I, I beat you wrong on, I got up at 4.20 this morning. I tend to get up when the sky starts to get light and that's my best time. I uh, do some sitting meditation in the morning. I have uh, two dogs. I come down and feed them. Um, I usually have, I might have my bowl of matcha and something light to eat. And then I take the dogs on a walk. Um, I have a garden that I tend to, I grow a lot of my own food. I try to get uh, walks in or swim every day. Uh, that's my favorite form of exercise. Um, I'm mentally active most in the morning. If I'm going to write uh, or, or do intellectual work, I like to do that in the morning. And uh, afternoons are more for relaxing, reading, uh, spending time with friends, uh, preparing food, cooking, um, you know, that's, that's my usual day. And I, I'm usually in bed by usually nine at the latest 10. Yeah. Love it. So much to think about there. Um, just to sort of close off this conversation, Dr. Wall, I'm interested. Um, you've seen a lot of changes in healthcare over the past 50 years, You've seen things come in, things go. You've seen things take the public interest and leave the public interest. If you look at the US healthcare system, because I know that's where you're based. I know you've traveled the world, so you're probably quite familiar, I think, with other healthcare systems. Yeah. It's very easy for, I think, many of us to criticize our own healthcare systems, other healthcare systems. But if, if you were to look at the US healthcare system, 
Yes, there are some negatives which you've spoken about before. You've spoken about on this show. You can perhaps recap on what some of those negatives are. But are there any positives that we can take that around the world we can learn and go, oh, God, America are doing that really, really well when it comes to health? You know, I'm really interested as to your view on that and you know how other countries need to evolve their healthcare systems as well. Well, we don't have a healthcare system in the US. We have a disease management system and it's functioning very imperfectly and getting worse by the minute. And also we, as the richest nation, are unable to guarantee basic healthcare services to all of our citizens. That's unconscionable. So those are the big black marks. I think as a result of the economic collapse of our healthcare system, you know, we, we're spending an outrageous amount of our gross domestic product on healthcare and have terrible health outcomes. Uh, that's unsustainable. But as a result of that, that is what's fueling the integrated medicine movement, which is much more developed in the US than it is anywhere else. If our healthcare system were not in such trouble, our institutions would not be open to this. You know, a, a lot of the uh, people that come to the fellows who come to us to study are sponsored by their institutions, by their hospital systems who are paying for their tuition. You know, this would not be happening if uh, the economics of healthcare in this country were in such a mess. Uh, so, and I see this happening around the world. You know, we were not getting any people from the UK until very recently, for example, or from Western Europe. But as, as the economics of healthcare begin to deteriorate everywhere, um, there is openness to integrative medicine. And I think that's the great change. If you enjoyed watching that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you will also really enjoy. The whole idea of reducing sugar by just adding unlimited amounts of these chemicals has to be thought through and we should be weaning people off ultra-sweetened products, which make them more likely, particularly kids, to, to seek sugar.